a message that you brought to us this morning. You know, for many people, Christmas is their favorite time of the year. Uh, holiday time, uh, getting together with family and friends, uh, delicious meals, Christmas baking. Uh, there's the gifts, uh, the decorations. And for most of us this year, we'll look a little bit different. You see, our holidays uh, will be spent at home, like we have been for, for far too long. Uh, our gatherings with our, our family and friends uh, will be moved from in-person to virtual online. Uh, as much as I will miss these things, maybe it won't be so bad for us. Uh, maybe by stripping away all of that, uh, we will focus on what Christmas is all about, the most marvelous event in the history of the world, uh, the Incarnation when God became man. Now the gospel comes to us through story, and scripture tells us a story. A story that is revealing both about who God is and who we are. And it starts with four words that kind of set the stage for everything. In the beginning, God. And from there we discover God's design for humanity. God is the creator. And as the pinnacle of his creation, he made man and woman. And it was very good, he said. And we see the beauty of, of relationship between God and humankind. But the story takes a bit of an ugly turn early in the Bible. And in Genesis 3, we are introduced to a new character, the serpent, uh, the, the tempter. And in the garden, the, the serpent lies to and tempts Adam and Eve and they give in. And through their act of disobedience uh, and their lack of faith in God, uh, consequences begin to unfold, and they are no longer able to live in close relationship uh, with the Almighty and Holy God. And now whether Adam and Eve were willing to admit their sin or not, uh, their rebellion came with, with great consequences. And they lost the ability to enjoy God's good gifts. And perfection was replaced with pain. And a joyful marriage became an unequal partnership. And uh, happy cultivation turned into sweaty toil. And the once imperishable bodies began to slowly decay and die. And as we read on in Genesis and throughout, uh, we find that murder and rape and disease and drunkenness and death are all further results of sin. Sin is ugly. I mean, you don't have to look very long in the news today to discover that. Not only did sin bring about physical death, but it also brought about spiritual death. And sin causes us uh, to reject God and to pursue our own uh, selfish and, and prideful desires. But in the midst of all the consequences uh, that we see listed in Genesis 3, we see this, this glimmer of hope and in Genesis 3.15, God says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So there will be hostility and conflict between Satan and his army of wickedness and humankind, specifically between Satan and the seed of the woman. He will strike a crippling blow, but the offspring of the woman will deliver the fatal final blow. And so the big question that the scriptures begin to ask is, who will this person be? Who is going to be this person who will defeat the evil one and deliver that fatal blow? Who will bring salvation and hope? And so in Genesis 6, uh, we meet this righteous man named Noah, and the question, could this be the guy? Right, This guy, he stood apart from the rest of humanity. But a few chapters later, we find him drunk inside of his tent. And then in Genesis 12, we meet a man named Abraham. Now, Abraham, he was known as the father of faith. Uh, could this be the guy? No, not him. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Joseph, this is the guy that uh, saved humanity, the known world from starvation during the famine. 
could this be the one who is going to save his people and defeat the enemy? No, it's not him. In fact, shortly after Joseph, Israel is relegated to hundreds of years of slavery. And throughout Scripture's story, we find uh, plenty of heroes of the faith, uh, Moses and Joshua and the judges. And then Israel asks for a king, just like all the other nations have. We need a king. He will be our deliverer. So they go and they find the, the tallest one among them, Saul. Well, it turns out Saul was a bit of a dud. Ah, but David, ah, this young boy who defeats the giant Goliath, could this be the one? Right, he not only defeats the giant, but he leads his nation in victory in battle after battle. Could this be the one who will finally conquer the evil one and bring salvation to his people? Yet later on we discover that David was a, an adulterer and a murderer. And throughout the Old Testament, we, we see prophecies of a Savior, of this Messiah, uh, and so God's people have hope. And we read about king after king. Uh, most of them, most of these people led their nation deeper into sin and eventually into exile. And so the question that people ask is, who will this Messiah be? And in the couple hundred years before Christ, there were various rebellions uh, by, led by different Jewish people. Could one of these be the Messiah? But each one failed. And so the people ask, who is this Messiah? Who is this Savior we've been waiting for? And I wonder what kind of image came to mind as they imagined who the Messiah would be. Or a mighty warrior like David? Or perhaps a more righteous version of Samson? You see, Isaiah prophesied about a coming Messiah about 700 years before Jesus was born. And we read in Isaiah 7, verse 14, that therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Now later in Isaiah 9, verse 6, we read, For, us to, for unto us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And throughout the generations, Israel, they had expectations of who this would be. And we read, uh, these, uh, we read these uh, prophecies today, and we see that God the Almighty, the Holy Creator, uh, would come in the person of of Jesus Christ in the flesh. But I don't think anyone was expecting that. This was beyond any expectation they could have possibly had. And then one day, to an unsuspecting teenage girl, an angel appears with a message that would shake the very foundations of heaven and earth. A message that would announce the arrival of someone so much more than anyone could have possibly imagined. Luke 1, 26 to 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now Mary, she was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of a greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will have no end. All right, what a message. Now I can only assume for Mary that this Isaiah 7, verse 14 verse would have been going through her mind. The virgin will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. And in this passage, I've always marveled at Mary's faith. I can only imagine uh, the fears and the concerns uh, that would have been pulsing through her. And yet we read that she has faith. And as much as I marvel at the faith of Mary, 
I marvel so much more in our God and the extent to which he went to save a people like us. So who is this Savior that is coming? Who is this Savior that's going to crush the head of the enemy? Who is this Savior that's going to bring victory, not just in the temporary, but for all time? It is Jesus. This child, this son of Mary, God in human flesh, born as a baby. And it was in that moment, on that first Christmas day, that God tore open the veil and entered into time and space, into our existence, into our humanity. The Savior that the people had been waiting for, uh, the one who crushed the head of the enemy and proclaimed victory, is here. God incarnate. Uh, Incarnate literally means to take on human flesh, to be embodied. Uh, In Colossians 1 verse 19, it tells us, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. And then in Hebrews 1 verse 3, we read, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Fully God, fully man. As I think about the incarnation and this Christmas season, I also recognize that it's been a pretty uh, tough season in a lot of ways. COVID has caused us to be uh, less personal and more physically distant from one another. And I really miss seeing you all every week. Uh, There is so much more value in our weekly connection and gathering and corporate worship uh, than we even realize. And when the day comes when we gather together in person again, my hope and my prayer is that we realize uh, just how important and significant uh, this time really is. And so back in spring, and then over this last couple of months too, uh, we've, been, we've moved our, our youth gatherings uh, online. And so we all sit in our own homes, and we connect as these individual uh, moving pictures on this screen. Now, students, they've been doing this for a while in school. A number of adults are doing this for their jobs. And while I appreciate uh, the technology that enables us to connect like this, uh, COVID and these online meetings have caused us to become excarnate or disembodied with one another. You see, that closeness, uh, that vulnerability, the, the, the physical touch that we need and long for has been removed in this time. And in these online spaces, they simply cannot happen the same way. And I'm not saying these are bad. I'm just saying that these virtual meetings should cause us to long uh, for the real thing, for the fullness, the closeness that we need. And in Jesus, the beauty of the incarnation is that God closed the gap and entered right into our existence, into our humanity as personally and intimately as possible. Using the image of uh, our online video chats, uh, Jesus tore open the computer screen and came right in, in person, in the flesh. And the more I reflect on the wonder that is the incarnation, uh, the more I'm astounded by it. Uh, The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless baby, needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. And we only find a a brief glimpse of Jesus as a boy when we find him uh, at the temple as his parents are are frantically searching for him. Uh, Hebrews 5 verse 8 tells us that Jesus learned obedience. And Luke tells us how he increased in wisdom and stature. Uh, We see in Jesus a man who grew up uh, learning the trade of a carpenter, just like his earthly father. In Jesus, we see a man who got tired and hungry. He experienced uh, emotions just like you and I do. The joy, uh, the frustration, uh, the excitement, and, and the sorrow. He experienced the beauty of friendship and family uh, in the good times and in the bad. Uh, He was a victim of gossip and slander and betrayal. Can you identify? 
In the Garden of Gethsemane, he went through stress so intense that his sweat was like drops of blood. And he went through persecution that we can't even imagine. He can identify with what you are going through. Fully God, fully man. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that he went through everything we do, yet without sin. Do you ever feel the heavy burden of temptation in your life? Uh, Jesus, in his humanity, went through that too. And throughout Jesus' whole life, Satan was hell-bent on destroying Jesus in any bold and creative way that he knew possible. Satan incited Herod against Jesus and his parents when Jesus was a baby. And Herod wreaked havoc by killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem who were two years old and younger. Herod incited uh, the religious leaders against Jesus who tried to discredit Jesus and were that form of gossip and slander and they would, they, they would eventually call for his execution. In Matthew 4, we read about how the devil himself tempted Jesus, tempted Jesus to receive power on Satan's terms. And you know, I'm pretty sure there were plenty of other moments in Jesus' life where Satan sought to attack Jesus and try to cause him to act out sinfully, because surely he thought, this is my chance to take down the Almighty God in this weak fragile and human state. And maybe Satan thought, uh, maybe he could get tempt, maybe he could tempt Jesus into really laying into someone who was complaining about his carpentry work. Or maybe he verbally attacked someone who was making fun of him or his family. Or maybe showing those religious leaders a thing or two. But Jesus overcame the temptation every time. And in Hebrews 2 verse 18, it says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. When you are feeling tempted, take heart because Jesus can identify with you because he went through the same things. And because he overcame, he is our strength through our own struggles. And when you are feeling beaten up uh, for having given in to temptation, Jesus is our hope, he is our forgiveness, he is our righteousness. Because when Jesus went to the cross, he bore the sins of the world upon himself so that you, can, so that you and I could be forgiven and set free. For those who have put their faith in Jesus, he took our sin and exchanged it with his righteousness. And not because we did anything to deserve it, but because of his love for us, because this is who our God is. J.I. Packer said, The incarnation, uh, God becoming human, is the most extraordinary miracle in all of Scripture. You see, every other miracle uh, prepares for this, exhibits this, or results from this. The incarnation displays the greatness of our God. See, our eternal God who created stars that are 10 million times brighter than our own sun, also created the womb from which he was born. And while deserving of nothing short of a royal palace, he was born in the humble poverty of a stable with low-class shepherds as his first guests. He is not a distant or withdrawn God. He is a humble, giving God who sees all people especially those who are weak and in need. Our God is a purposeful, planning God, not a random or reactionary God. Our God is a God who redeems us by his blood, not a God who leaves us in our sin. Jesus did not become human simply so that he could experience some of the things that we do, you know, like food and sleep and, and all of that, to trade the majesty of heaven for an earthly experience for that reason, would be completely absurd. Jesus came in the flesh under the law to fulfill the law on our behalf. He became human in order to be the savior of humankind. And he entered into the mire and the muck of our world for only he was able to pull us out. Jesus went to the cross to die the death we deserve. And the cross is where we see the serpent strike the heel of our savior. That's where we see that crippling blow 
But Jesus did not stay dead. You see, the resurrection is the moment that our Savior struck the fatal blow to the serpent's head and proclaimed victory once and for all. And Jesus turned the cross into his throne and his execution was his exaltation. For Jesus, the nativity was kind of a, it was a riches to rags story. He came from the majesty of heaven and was born into the humble stable below. And for us, it marks the opening scene of the greatest uh, rags to riches story. As someone said, Christ was content with a stable when he was born so that we could have a mansion when we die. You know, there is nothing written, no story, no movie, no work of fiction or reality that compares to the wonder that is the incarnation, that God would become human to show us the wonder of who he is, to show us his love and to save us, his people, from the very mess we got ourselves into. R.C. Sproul said, What we celebrate at Christmas is not so much the birth of a baby, but the incarnation of God himself. What we celebrate at Christmas is not so much the birth of a baby, but the incarnation of God himself. This is the wonder of Christmas. Christmas.